Okay. So yeah, this talk uh, will be about introducing, introducing you the paradigm behind Spinal XDL. It will not be a syntax uh, presentation, really paradigm. To give you the key difference between what we are used to and what Spinal XDL is really behind the hood. So here I will give Spinal XDL example, but uh, it also applies to other languages like Chisel, like uh, FHDL, maybe you hear about it through Litex or Mygen, and many, and probably many other uh, open source uh, hardware description language or hardware description tools. And one main question could be why those languages exist. Uh, so I will not argue about that. I will just say it exists because some people are not happy to write the XDL Verilog or System Verilog to describe their hardware. So let's go on now. This is, this is a simple example of Spinal XDL, just to show you how you can use it uh, in a similar way, kind of, uh, than what you are used if you use VXDL or Verilog. So the first thing to understand is Spinal XDL is embedded into a general purpose programming language. So Spinal XDL is a Scala library. So here I'm using Scala. It could have been a Python library. It could have been a C++ library. The idea is we are using software as an elaboration tool for the hardware we want. So let's go through the example. First, we are importing the Spinal XDL tool in the Scala language. Then, because we're in a Scala language, if we want to ask the tool to generate the hardware we want, we have to ask the tool, like, convert something into Ver Verilog, which is this top level. So this is the entry point of our generation to ask the tool to generate our things. And if we look at what is the top level in a given case, it is a Scala class, which extends component to say that it is a hierarchical component, hierarchical thing in our design, like a module in Verilog or uh, entity component in VXDL. And then we define, for instance, in the given case, in the given case, everything is, everything is combinatorial, uh, where we define a, a, B, a and B as input unsigned of 8 bits, result as an output of 8 bits unsigned. And then we generate a uh, adder between A and B. So when, when Scala will effectively run this line of code, he will first execute this expression. And then, when you execute it, it will add into the netlist, into the netlist that we are generating, it will add the corresponding other gate. And then, he will see this assignment operator, so he will assign it to the given output. So, it's really running software to fill a netlist of the other design we want. Uh, running software, yeah. So, a little bit more um, complete example to really show you you can do what you are used to do in VXL and Verilog in Spinal XDL. Like, a simple example, of course, like where here, if we want to define a register, we say we want a reg of, in the given case, 8-bit uh, unsigned. So things are explicit. That's not like in VXDL and Verilog where things are inferred because you are using them into a clocked process. Here, if you want a register, you say, I want a register, and that's it. And then, for instance, here we are defining a signal full, which will be true when the counter is at 255. And here we have a conditional uh, statement. Uh, if uh, not full, then increment the counter. So quite simple stuff. But now I will go deeper. Now I will go in some lengths uh, which are quite different than what we are used to by using this example. This is a stupid and dummy example, but that's just to show you how it can work behind the wood, how you can mix uh, Scala with Spinal XDL, and really using Scala as an elaboration tool. So when I say elaboration, you have to understand that, for instance, in uh, VXDL, uh, if generate is an elaboration feature of VXDL, a for loop, it's also an elaboration feature. You can use it to help the synthesis tool understand what you want, and then the synthesis tool will, for instance, unroll the loop and do things. And here we can do kind of the same, but not exactly. So here is, there is the reference uh, hardware, this described in a regular way, where we say we have a count signal A, B, and C, uh, which are a register of 8 bits. And we say that when the count is true, we want to increment all our register. That's completely useless, but that's an example. 
And there is an alternative way of describing that, which is, again, useless, but for the example, where, okay, we define uh, cond uh, A, B, and C as, as before. That's because uh, I put it in gray to show that it is as before without modification. And then we will go into the software world. We will, we will create a variable named regs, which is not hardware, because it is an array buffer. And an array buffer is something which comes from the Scala library. It is a dynamic array. Like in some language, it's named vector. In some other language, it's named list. Uh, for instance, this one in Scala is named array buffer. And this software array buffer can store re references to, in the given case, uh, elements of the design which are of unsigned type. OK, so then we add reference into our array buffer. Again, this is pure software. Pure software, we're adding A, B, and C into this uh, array buffer. And then, which will create this software data structure. And then we will look at this data structure to translate that into real hardware. So as before, we check if the count is true. And then we will iterate in software over all the elements of our regs array and say that the given signals which was referenced should uh, be assigned by himself to this one. And this will result exactly in the same hardware that just we used software as an elaboration tool. But now I will come to a practical example. It's important to have a relation with the practice. So imagine you have a memory bus here and some register like reg A and reg B, and you want to memory map them uh, to the memory bus uh, in read and write, for example. So here there is a standard implementation like you can do in VHDL, more or less, and where you define, for instance, an APB tree bus of given width, uh, reg A and reg B as registers. And then you check if the bus wants to do a write. And then you know you have this big, big switch statement with all the registers where they are mapped, and in which condition you have to write them, like reg A is assigned by the bus here, and where uh, you can read them. So pretty regular stuff. And now we will look how to apply the things I just showed you in the previous slide to that example, and how to go beyond the traditional way of doing things. So first, what is a memory mapping? Basically, it's saying, OK, at which address I have which data of my hardware. So let's create a class to model that in software. Let's, let's, let's model that. And then, then let's uh, define an array, uh, an array buffer which will serve as a specification of which memory mapping we want for our whole memory bus. So, and then we will add element into our specification to say, OK, I want to map at the address 0, reg A. Or I want to map uh, at the address 4, reg B, which will create this software data structure. And then, as before, we have to flush it into actual hardware. So to do that, we will reuse as before, like, is, do my bus want to do a write? I have to do a big switch statement into hardware anyway. But then we will iterate over this data structure. So for each element of our specification, we will get a given line of, for the memory mapping. So then this line and then this line in the for loop. And then we will generate an is statement, like now is the hardware value of my address equal to the address of the memory mapping? So we have, a, we have a switch statement in which there is a follow-up and in which there is an is statement. That's really specific. That's really because we are generating stuff. We can do that in, this, in that context. And then we can just map the data of the mapping to the memory bus a bit as before. So, OK, that's good. But a lot about software engineering is about to make things reusable. So let's define a tool which will capture this uh, capability by creating a class. Let's name this class APB tree mapper, which takes as argument on which bus we want to memory map things. And let's add our specification into the tool, because we need to field, field the specification to that tool to say him what he has to do. And let's move the code which was flushing that into hardware into a function flush that we can call once we field the specification with everything we want. So we will say everything to the tool, like map this guy to this guy, this guy to this guy. And at the end, we will call this function flush to generate the corresponding hardware. So, And then, 
If you want to use that tool, there is a user code. Like, imagine you want to redesign this peripheral, this memory mapping, this release the bank. So, as before, you will define your arbitrary bus, reg A, reg B, and then you will create an instance of the tool that was defined before to do memory mapping. You will add to the specification of this tool that there is mapping at address 0, mapping at address 4, on this register, this register, and you will call the function flush. So this is, this is one of the first steps of, I would say, like design automation. And the good thing is we are still fully integrated into the spinal Dell flow. We are not living in a third-party tool which is written in another language to handle a uh, register bank. Here, I could write hardware statement just next to that, and that's perfectly fine. I could write here, like, uh, reg A or reg B. That's perfectly fine. We are not breaking the flow, and that's really important to have a smooth hardware design experience. So, and then, yeah, here there is something a bit bad, is that you have to manually feed the specification, you have to know the internals of the memory mapping tool, you have to feed his specification with the mapping class. There is a bit of boilerplate code. So I really don't like that. I really don't like monkey coding. So let's do that. Let's add into a APB3 memory, memory, uh, mapping tool a function named read-write. And when you call this function, you say who you want to be accessible where uh, in read and write, and it will add the thing to the specification here. And then this is what becomes the user code. You just have to write the function like to my memory mapper, please make this given register readable and writable as a, as a given address. It hides things, it makes things a bit more abstract. You don't lose, con you don't lose control by adding those abstractions. It's really to, to make the things easier to use. But the distance to the hardware is still really close. You can just look how it is implemented and go in, there is no magic. Okay, so uh, that's better, but that could be even better, because really often what you do is creating a register, a lot of registers, so here we have reg A and reg B appearing two times in the same code, that's really bad. Could be better, like in our pp3 mapper tool, we will add a function like, okay, mapper tool, please create a read and write register at this given address. You don't give the register that you want to make accessible, you say to the tool, please create me this register, I need it, at this address. And there is a function, like here you say explicitly, okay, when this function is called, please create a register of 32 bits, uh, add it into the memory mapping at the specified address, and return me this register. And then the user code is like this, defining the bus as before, instantiating this uh, APB3 memory mapping tool, and saying, I want reg A, to be uh, something that the, that the mapper, I mean, asks the memory mapper to create a read and write register at address zero. And this register will be named register A. And same thing for register B. So the point of this example is really that you can, by mixing software as an elaboration tool with hardware generation tool, we can obtain some kind of nice synergy together to to really avoiding always writing the same again and again. So, yeah, that was an example. Uh, I, made it, I made it really simple. There is a lot of other things which would be required to have it usable in a practical way. Uh, I have it, just I simplified it for the slides, like uh, supporting like read-only, write-only, write, uh, set and write, these kind of other memory mapping uh, primitives. But yeah, let's keep things simple for a moment. Like things like generating the C header file from the software specification we made, we could do it. And also, yeah, this is more about uh, software modeling. Maybe you know UML. This is the kind of thing you can do in hardware design. It makes sense. Like, for instance, you can have an abstract definition of what a memory mapper tool could do and have multiple implementations of it that you can swap around really easily. So, yeah. That's it for this example, and now I will just give you some other practical cases to just show you that it's not only about mapping memories. So one example is uh, for one of the FCC I had to do. I had to design an AXE4 uh, crossbar. So I create a tool to make it easier to instantiate. Like, 
if I want, if I, if I have a design where I have an instruction cache, data cache, VGA controller, which need to access some memories like a RAM, a SD RAM, and some peripherals through a IPB bridge, this is how the whole interconnect is done in that SOC. The interconnect, which will really link all, everybody together. Like, okay, you say, I want IXE uh, for a crossbar factory. I want to add some slaves, like the RAM will be mapped at this uh, region of the memory, SDRAM at this region, uh, peripherals at this region. And then you come later and you say, okay, and then I have some new connections to add, new master to add in my system. There are my, my master, and there is to which slave they can access. I don't want each master to be able to access everybody because it will cost me resources to add all those mixes. So here you have a fine control of what you want. And then when you specified everything to this tool, you just say, build yourself, like flush yourself. That's, that's okay, I give you everything you can generate yourself now. Now that you know all I want, please do it. And this tool here is built kind of the same way, same way than the one I have showed you before. That's really similarly done. So, and the last example is probably uh, the most successful one is of this kind of experiments is VEX RISC V, so it is a 32-bit soft core, yeah, RISC V core mainly made for FPGA. And at the beginning, it was an experiment. At the beginning, it was an hardware description experiment, how to express hardware to make to make a CPU flexible. Like I want to be able to remove uh, instruction from my pipeline. I want to add some custom ones without having to mess around the whole code and having some dirty tricks to do or modifying the code base. So in this instance, the CPU uh, can go from two stages to four stages plus how many fetch, fetch stages you want, the, uh, plus some parameterization. Uh, for instance, the decoder logic is done automatically via Quinn McCluskey algorithms analyzing the decoding specifications that I give uh, to the decoding unit. Um, and the whole CPU is built around a plug-in system. That means, for instance, the ELU is not part of the C CPU uh, hardware description. It's a plug-in that you insert in the CPU via parameterization. So, which means you can also add, you can swap it out just by implementing your own ELU implementation and swapping it in the parameter during parameterization. And basically, those plugins are built around a two-phase, like setup phase, for all plugins of the system to talk to each other to know what they want. So to add, to add a new instruction, maybe your new instruction plugin will need to ask the decoder plugin to ask him creating a new decoding logic for its own usage or thing like this. And it uses like many software approaches, like abstract classes, hash map, all kind of data structure to help the generation of this CPU. And the best thing about it is, it's, it's not only really flexible, but it's also really good in the implemented hardware. Like, f to have a small CPU, you can go down uh, to the simplest one, which will use less than 500 lookup table and not 7 and go at plus 300 megahertz. And it can go up into a Linux-ready uh, CPU uh, for just like 2K dot half uh, lookup tables with MMU, with instruction cache, data cache, machine mode, supervisor mode, user mode, uh, GTAG to debug it, everything, and with good performances. So this as a proof that RISC-V is really well fitted for FPGA, because if you compare this with NIOS 2 or MicroBlaze number, it's, it looks good. So, and as well inspire some people, like this guy who write, if you are interested in understanding how it's described to CPU, you can look uh, at the blog of this guy, it wrote some article, so hopefully I didn't write it because I would not be able to write it. But yeah, look at this if you are interested. And that's it for this talk. Uh, there is some links in case of you want to join me, mainly on Gitter if you want to chat. Thank you. Uh, oh, obviously, this spinal HDL looks very like chisel. Um, uh, why did you kind of see the need for a kind of incompatible fork? Uh, why? 
Why did you see the need to kind of fork away with a uh, few different syntaxes to learn yeah, so slightly different? Um, it, it forked, I mean, that's, first, that's history. Because that was maybe, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I don't even remember. At that stage, his Kaiser were not so well polished. And for my own interest, I tried to implement my own thing, at least to understand how it could work. And then it worked so well that I just continued my way. And I would say there is some type, uh, it's a bit more strongly typed. There is some kind of text which are different. I'm more from my FPGA and very dead background, so you can smell a bit of that into the language. Uh, Shazel, I would say, is a bit more Verilog and ASIC oriented, so there is some difference there and there. But yeah, that's mainly historical. It will be feasible. Yeah, it's really not really far. It's, it's really not really far. That's right. It's, it's quite close. Do we have any other question? If not, if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Sorry,